Hi everybody, it's Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, Stories of the Supernatural. How are you all doing today? And today I have a super special guest. Uh, this is a gentleman who has been involved in the field of the paranormal for quite some time. He's also written several books. His name is Jeff Dyer and he is the author of a series of nonfiction guides for ghost hunters. And he's also authored articles for medical journals, uh, chapters for textbooks, novels, 150 songs, and two screenplays for television. He was born in the heart of San Francisco Bay Area and spent his early years in Alameda. He earned a bachelor's degree and two master of science degrees and a Ph.D., uh, fascinated with the paranormal, Jeff is an active paranormal investigator, researcher, lecturer, consultants. He's participated in various um, paranormal shows that are out there. How are you doing tonight, Jeff? Great. Nice to be with you. Likewise, likewise. Um, what I love about you is that you are one of these persons that's been involved with the paranormal for many years, long before it became quite so mainstream as it is today. Um, and there's a lot, there's not that many people realize that once upon a time there wasn't always digital photography and all the equipment that they've got nowadays. And uh, I mean, the field has come quite a ways, I would say, in the last maybe 20 years or 15 years. Uh, the, yes, the evolution has been absolutely amazing in a lot of ways. It has led a lot of ghost hunters astray, however, because too many of them are quick to jump on the newest tech bandwagon yes. and grab the newest thing that has come along and sometimes spending quite a lot of money on yes. it, uh, only to find out that the device really doesn't do what it's supposed to do because it's not that sensitive to paranormal activity. It picks up a lot of natural activity in the environment. For instance, uh, EMF meters, which a lot of people use, and you see these on the ghosted uh, ghost shows on TV, EMF meters will, will indicate a signal if somebody drives by an wow. electric car 500 feet away. Oh my God. So if somebody is like three blocks from where you are, you'll get this big signal and you think, oh, there's a ghost here. Well, no, it's somebody's Tesla coming down the street. If an electric train comes by 1,500 feet away, wow. the device will also emit a signal. And, you know, even, even less dramatic than that, nails and joist hangers and even wires with no electricity in them will create signals that some of these devices pick up. So, you know, the evolution has given us a lot of equipment, but it has also offered a lot of opportunities to go astray in terms of what you're really picking up on your instrumentation. Yeah, unless you're on truly, truly in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can see where you could get a lot of uh, false readings that, and, and and let's face it, it's, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but to find yourself in such a setting to do uh, an investigation, that's not that common. You're, you're, you know, you have too many things around you that can give you that type of reading, yeah. Oh, yeah, and there are things that you just don't know about, too. Sometimes we go into a house to investigate and we're unaware that somebody is in the basement w working on a computer that generates a lot of electromagnetic fields. And so we're unaware of that, and, and we'll pick up those signals on an EMF recorder and other devices as well. But there's still been this great evolution, and I'm really happy to see it because it really brings people closer to understanding that Humans are spiritual beings in addition to physical beings, and right. I truly believe that the spirit survives bodily death, and that's what gives us ghosts. Right. And let me ask you something, Jeff. Um, obviously, you're involved with this now. How did you get um, involved with the paranormal? Did you have an experience as a child? Or what happened? Yeah, my story is actually fairly common. I had my first paranormal experience when I was about 12 years old. I grew up on an island community in Alameda, which is in San Francisco Bay. And the island has a lot of old Victorian mansions and mm -hmm. places. And, and uh, I, we were living in one of them. Um, okay. And I happened to see a sailor walk down the street past our house as I was gazing oh out the window. Oh, my God. Yeah, and this guy looked at me, and he had no eyes, and it scared me because I was just 12 years old, and I was freaked out, 
And as I watched him, he continued walking past our property and just disappeared. And it was then that I realized that I could see things that we call ghosts. Uh-huh. And from that point on, my, my friends and I used to get into some of these vacant mansions. And there were quite a few of them in Alameda in those days. Uh-huh. And we'd walk around and I'd hear things, see things, feel things. And that made me aware that I could pick up. I was sensitive to paranormal uh, activity. Right. And I had to set that aside for many years while I pursued my education, but I got back into it, and I've been doing it now for about 25 years, yes. and it preceded uh, Ghost Adventures and Ghost Hunters exactly. and all the shows you see on TV. In yes. fact, I was thrilled when the, the show uh, Ghost Whisperer came out, because mm-hmm. you know, that was 2005, I believe, and um, yeah. I thought, wow, this is great, because now people are going to start seeing what I see. Right. I mean, yeah, this was around the time also that they had that other show, Medium, um, mm-hmm, that was yes. supposedly also based on uh, Real Life Psychic. I, I remember that mm-hmm. they both came out more or less around the same time because prior to that, mostly what they had was um, little mini docus, not even series, you know, mini documentaries about certain haunted places and things like yeah. that. And maybe they had a maybe they had a psychic walk in there, but that was the extent of it. Yeah, late in in the 1990s, a show called uh, Sightings yes, I remember. was on TV, and I love that because mm-hmm. much of it was not paranormal, but they had enough paranormal um, stories in there to really arouse my interest, and so I love that show. I was really sad when it went off the air, yeah. but yeah, that we had that, and we had uh, just you know occasionally, usually around Halloween, yes. uh, some network would do some some documentary on paranormal activity or something like that. And that's all you had, Yeah, you yes. know, and yeah. now, now we have actually quite a lot on TV. Yes, a lot. I mean, and that's the thing. And, and, and you know, and I tell everybody, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I understand the concept of all the equipment is that basically they're either trying to quantify, capture some type of proof, you know, but then I'm thinking yes. to myself, uh, you know, you could have a psychic go in there. Uh, or sensitive, and pick up on something that ha- you can't record it. In other words, they could be having either seeing something, uh, either visually or in their mind's eye, or feeling something, or, or I mean, a number of things that there's no way to to produce proof. In other words, so sometimes yeah, yeah. It's, so it's sometimes I think that. Uh, because I've had I've seen some shows that they're like, no, we strictly do the only with the equipment, you know, and we lay out, you know, yards and yards of equipment, you know, cables and all this and like anything except that it's, if it's not captured, it's like doesn't exist. And I'm like, eh. I don't think that's. Yeah, happening. there's there's a lot of bias in the community. There are people who are strictly techies, I call yes. them. And ghost ghost hunters is a good example of that. Uh, they bring in three vans full of technical devices and lay out the cables, as you said. And, uh, you know, some of us have talked to them about including psychics, and they're definitely against it. Oh, no, they're like... Absolutely yes. against it. And yet, when you listen to them at the end of each episode, mm-hmm. they will sit down with their client and they'll say, well, we all had some personal experiences. Well, that's what it is. That's exactly. what the psychic experience is. It's a personal experience of feeling something, hearing something, maybe even seeing something. Yes. So they they claim they're not going to use psychics, but they actually admit to a psychic experience. But Ghost Ghost Adventures is a good show because they use a lot of technical devices, but they yes. do include people who have te- well, I have think psychic they've, abilities. They've loosened up. Uh, now, to, you know, I would say in the last few years, but at the very beginning, they were more, you know, I, you know, the the adventure lockdown part, and of course, they had their equipment. But I think that they've loosened up where they're talking so much, also not by what they're seeing, actually seeing, but also their feelings. You know, in other words, their own sensitivity. It plays oh yeah, like, that they they're their own psychics or something along those lines. It's, that, a, they've used it's psychics a big as well. It's a big part of the show. I've been on the show four times, okay. and I'll tell you, they're keenly interested in 
in psychic experiences and they've made they've featured some of my yes, psychic that's exactly what i mean that they they'll bring in psychics on certain shows or for certain locations so yeah they they've they've realized that that it's not a one size fit all kind of thing that you could use mm -hmm. this approach for certain locations and this other approach for other locations and don't get me wrong i'm all for capturing evidence if that's what you can want to do but i tell people a lot of times because i've been doing investigations since the 1990s myself and i tell everybody the supernatural is not an on-demand thing you could go someplace and not capture anything that doesn't mean nothing's there it's just mm -hmm. that maybe it's cyclical. Maybe you're there at the wrong time, on the wrong date. Uh, it could be a number of things. And then there's other times you walk in there and 15 minutes in, you're like, okay, you know, I, things have happened to me sometimes. I wasn't ready to capture anything. I was just like walking around, basically. Mm -hmm. and yeah, there's, there's, there's a couple of things that play into what you're talking about. One of them is that uh, an individual's receptivity is largely what determines whether you can go into a place and feel something one day and not feel it the next. Mm -hmm. But also it has to do with whether the ghost is really awake and transmitting yes. information tele telepathically by producing psychic energy, which we call uh, expressive psi. Mm -hmm. Most ghosts exist in a state of, of suspended animation. Yes. Yes, they do. Suspended there asleep, and it's only when you wake them up yes. and they become interested in you, the individual, that they'll transmit psychic energy to you, and that's when you hear things, feel things, and actually see apparitions. Yes. So there's two things that have to happen. The ghost has to transmit with a high degree of energy, and you have to have a high degree of receptivity. If either one of those is lacking, then there is no paranormal experience. Yeah. And let me ask him, Jeff, because I've sometimes and I've seen sometimes you do have, and this I'm talking intelligent hauntings. I'm not talking a residual or something, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen the ones that do want to communicate, and then there's the ones that don't want to communicate. They're aware of you, but not you. It's not they just don't mm -hmm. want to communicate with anybody. Like if they, the last they want to do is participate, of, and then then they're the other ones that are like falling over themselves to manifest in some way, you know, sometimes they can, sometimes they can, sometimes there's nobody there to that they, they can reach. So it's almost like I, I've i seen the two versions, the ones that are trying, maybe they have a message or maybe they're lost, whatever's going on. And then they're the ones that either because they fear they're going to be thrown out, or they, they've got their own thing going on and they just like kind of disappear into the woodwork, uh, especially yeah. when there's a team or new people that come into, let's say a house that's already occupied. All right. Mm -hmm. And they kind of like whoosh, and then and and I've seen that happen before. Uh, everybody, you know, it, it I've seen that some it, sometimes it's not even as and then, like you said, sometimes you have the right people there. But uh, I've seen where some entities, they don't want to be told to leave. They they might even be aware that they're dead, in other words, <laughs> but they just well, yeah. stay there. <laughs> There are a lot of ghosts that are where they are because they are unaware they've died. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when we investigate crime scenes or accident scenes, that's principally what we run into are ghosts yes. that don't know they died. Yes. And they're quite confused and frightened and they freeze up. And that's why they are still at that location of a murder or a fatal accident. Yes. And they're quite in shock when you start convincing them that they've actually died. Right. And I've also heard sometimes when you have, because of course, everybody always relates like, you know, the person that drives tragically or violently, you know, as your, you know, your usual suspects for being ghosts. But I found also that sometimes when you have somebody that dies, maybe anesthetized or heavily medicated, or even sometimes, let's say, um, they say they had an accident, they were unconscious, and then they go to an operating room, and then they die. That they kind of miss that part where they they died. <laughs> they, yeah. The last thing they remember is, I was okay, or they miss that part of what whatever it was that happened to them. And then mm -hmm. they come exactly. to that thing where they're, they're self-aware, in other words, um, but nobody basically communicates with them or acknowledges them. 
and then that's when mm-hmm. they do the what happened. You know, they they totally missed the whole part where they died. And sometimes I know that they, you know, because we always hear about that thing, especially with those near death experiences where you have the family member, the friend, or somebody come to get you, and the white light, and all of that. But in some cases, I've heard, especially when that entity is still self aware. In other words, they they know something's going on, but they don't know they're dead. And let's say if they have, let's say, grandma come to get them, which they know it's dead. They're like, mm-hmm. you're dead. I'm not going with you. I'm alive. <laughs> they still yeah. have a problem with the quite acceptance fr- part. <laughs> so They're yeah. quite freaked out about that. Yeah. yeah. And those ghosts become really erratic um, yes. when they finally have that realization. Yes. It's really yes. Uh, sometimes difficult to deal with them and sometimes kind of uh, sad, too, because uh, their, their devastation at realizing they're dead really can can spill over. And people who are empathic mm-hmm. will pick up that and get quite upset. I've been to investigations where people in our team have simply broken down because they picked up that, that devastating emotional experience of realizing that the body's dead. Right. Because it, to many people, it represents a closed door. You're not going back mm-hmm. to that life you, you've known. And that's pretty tough to take. Sure, especially if one of two things, you die unexpectedly, uh, or two, you die violently. Let's say somebody does something to you, mm-hmm. and you feel like, hey, I, does anybody know what happened, or that this person killed me, or that, you know, whatever the case might be. It, it, and I find that stuff, that's a very strong emotional anchor uh, f- for a human soul, where... You, your, your ego is still there, in other words. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you still want to work it out, like you said, and, and, you, and you can't come quite to grips with uh, there's no revolving door on this. So I guess that that's when they get stuck in that in-between place, um, which is – and from what I understand, um, even the, 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 the nicest person, let's say in you trans – uh, let's say you die, it beca- you can become very frustrated. In other words, it brings out also the worst in human nature in it when you're caught in that in-between place where uh, I was alive and now I'm dead. I think I'm not sure. Somebody tell me what to do. Why can't anybody see me? Uh, I need to tell them that I left my will under the, you know, whatever. Whatever it is. Because yeah. and, and a lot of yeah. people, I tell them, you know what? We are all we are the center of each of our own universes. We're the most important person there. And what we think of individually as important, super important, maybe to another person, you're thinking, you'd get stuck for that? But I'm thinking, yeah, it's for some people especially if they left something hanging, yeah, it is important to them, really important. Uh, and uh, it, their perceptions are reality just like it is for all of us. And mm-hmm. uh, that's a host of a variety of reasons why, you know, sometimes uh, spirits get anchored here. Um, have you had, uh, do you do anything as far, because I know, like you said, obviously you see them uh, as far as when you tell them, uh, do you know you're dead? <laughs> do they, uh, have you ever had any that you've been able to cross over or what's your experience with that? Well, I've been with other investigators who have done the crossover mm-hmm. ritual. Okay. But I have, I have some feelings about that because <clears throat> I think it's rather presumptuous to kind of push a spirit over you know, crossing over, whatever that means. Okay. That barrier usually uh, is interpreted as a one-way street. You go, th- you go cross over it, and you're not right. coming back. Right. And there are spirits who are on this plane uh, who may actually have some authentic good business to do, and they oh, need sure. to look over something. And I think it's a little presumptuous to go into a place and identify a spirit and say, oh, you're stuck here. i got to push you over. Oh, no, 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 i got to no. move over. Yeah, so I think that's not a good thing to do. I think it's best to try to get to know the spirit and find out if it's truly lost and right, wants to move right. on or if it's there for a good reason. Right, or that, like, which is usually some what I think of is the ones that just are not quite sure that they're dead that they know they're confused and sometimes they're angry and they just want somebody to tell them what happened 
like you know and i think that helps a lot because um and uh but no absolutely not you can't i think that even uh after death we still have uh our a free choice you know yes. as to what we're going to do yes exactly exactly i agree completely with you yes so people who are really enthusiastic about going in and uh, crossing over spirits. I I really try to slow that down a little bit and just don't be so pres- presumptuous as to think that that's really what the spirit w- wants. No, they could, they could, they, yeah. they sometimes, sometimes they do it on their own. I found sometimes that um, if you, you know, if you have that ability and you kind of communicate and kind of say, yeah, you're dead, they figure it out later on when they're ready mm-hmm. to go. Like, yeah, yeah. You, you they know, will. You go, sure. you go away and you think about it and you go, oh, so that's why, I or whatever, you know, then just come to terms yeah. with it and move on. Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I know that, in, like you said, out there in that area where you're from, like there's a lot of, um, a lot, as a matter of fact, I read about a year ago that there was a house out in San Francisco that apparently when they started doing some renovations, the garage, they came up, they, they found a child's coffin. It turns out that I guess there's a lot of cemeteries that they were oh, supposed yeah. to move, but they didn't quite. <laughs> this is one of the things that makes San Francisco one of the most haunted places I've ever been to, and I live really? close to it. Um, in, in 1902, San Francisco had a plague epidemic. A lot of people don't know that, but the plague that struck Europe in the Middle Ages struck San Francisco in 1902. Really? Yeah, and it, it was devastating. And the that. graveyards filled up really fast, and there were about 35 graveyards in San Francisco. Right. Many of them dated from the gold rush days when right, exactly. you, know, you had two or three guys died, and they just kind of buried them outside the, the saloon, mm-hmm. you know, basically. Mm-hmm. So by 1902, there were 35 cemeteries, and the city fathers were very afraid that if you buried a corpse, that it could still infect the living people around it. So they said, we've got to move all the cemeteries out of San Francisco. And they did that. They moved them down to the peninsula about 20 miles south, a place called Colma. Right, yes, However. There were three official cemeteries left behind. The the military cemetery in the Presidio was left there, of course. Mm-hmm. And the Mission Dolores Cemetery, which dated from 1778, it's a small cemetery, really small, but the graves there were, were left untouched. And then a third place called the Neptune Columbarium, which opened in 1896, and it holds the ashes of about 7,800 people. Really? So those were left there. Okay. But the other 32 were moved. And they would pick up the headstones and move them down to Colma and put them in the ground. And they would leave the coffins behind in San Francisco. Right. It described something where they had like a system which was very haphazard as to, oh, we have a coffin here, coffin here. And they took some up, but they left a bunch yeah, behind. They left a bunch and they collected their paycheck yeah. for doing a quarter of the work they were supposed to do. So what you do these days is, as you said, people will, you know, renovate a house, put in a swimming pool, uh, open up a basement or something and find, guess what, a coffin. Oh. And that's that's actually happened all around the Bay Area here. Wow. And most recently, the, the one you, the incident you're referring to was they found a cast iron coffin with yes. a little girl that in it. That one, that was incredible. And she looked just like she died yesterday. Yes, because it was airtight, yes. It was like it's incredible. It was airtight, plus the iron, the iron provided the proper environment to prevent oxidation of the body. And um, it was beautiful, beautiful little girl. She died around, I think, four, five, six years old. Right. And she was buried with a rose, and the rose was actually intact as well. That's incredible. When you looked at that, you look at She even has, like, she looks like a doll. She looks like she's asleep. It's incredible yeah. how. Yeah, and 
And there's a lot of places in the Bay Area that down in Los Gatos that that same kind of thing's been found. There was a little boy found about 1990 when the sewer was rebuilt. Really? Um, yeah, and they found him. And the interesting thing about that is he died about 1915 or something like that, and his sister was still alive. Well, did you hear the one, the uh, which I think was really neat, the um, the little girl... They um, they they took a hair follicle, and mm -hmm. about a year later, they were able to, they, you know, they went back on the old maps of the cemetery when it was originally there, and they kind of like, basically, it, you know, got down to a few families, and they were able to find one family who they thought it was, and they were able to match her by DNA. And they got her real name, mm -hmm. and I think it was her great-grand-nephew or something, uh, who was still alive, and they were able to do a perfect match. And I thought that's spectacular. Of course, the wonders yeah. of DNA. But yeah, her name was Edith, and she was uh, yes. she was almost three years old. Yes. And yeah, 1876, she died. Yeah. So it, this is not an uncommon experience. This has happened actually up in Seattle as well, and it's really exciting to see that. Um, mm -hmm. And it, you know, you you wonder where her spirit has been all this time, because there is a place in San Francisco, the neighborhood surrounding the Neptune Columbarium was was once one of the largest cemeteries in San Francisco, okay. called Lone Lone Mountain Cemetery. That's where this coffin was found. But people around that whole neighborhood are have told me that they experienced paranormal activity in their homes, and I said, well, have you ever? dug under your home or had an occasion to do that for whatever uh -huh. reason. But they haven't. But I said, if chances are you've got a couple of coffins under your home and you, yeah, you don't really know it. That. And that kind of freaks them out a little bit. I bet it does. I bet it does. It's like, do we really want to renovate? Let me think about that first. <laughs> yeah. There was well, a place it, in New... And from what There's I a place in New Orleans where the same thing happened not too long ago. Somebody was building a swimming pool and they found 17 coffins. Right. And I heard about, uh, I want to say maybe like a year ago also in Philadelphia, in the part that what they call the old city, which is the, the old, older part of, the, of Philadelphia. The same thing. Um, they had, uh, they were, they had had buildings there before, but they had demolished the buildings and they were going to put a high rise. So they, I guess they dug in and they found a cemetery from the 1700s who supposedly was moved right after the Civil War. But surprise, it wasn't moved. Same thing, yeah. they were supposed to move the coffins to a new cemetery that was way out further from the city. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, expediency and cost. <laughs> that yeah. was so they had built other buildings since after the Civil War there, but those have been demolished and they were supposed to, they were putting in a high rise and that's when they found all these coffins. So you're right, yeah. that's that's more common than people think as far as um that poltergeist mm -hmm. moment. <laughs> you moved the grave exactly. stuff, but you left the coffins you left the, the coffins yeah. or whatever behind. Yeah. Sure. One of the things I do when I investigate haunted places is I go and look at the history of the land, mm -hmm. and very often I find that there were things that went on there that suggest there may be graves underneath. When I grew up in Alameda, there was a street called Mound Street, and I was curious about why they called it Mound Street, because it didn't look like it went up a mountain of any sort. Okay. But. But what we have learned since is all around the Bay Area, in many places, 30 or 40 locations, there were mounds created by Indians when oh they lived here. And they created these mounds full of shells and other debris from their villages, but they also buried their dead in these mounds. Oh and so Mound Street was a place where they had discovered Indian remains. And as a kid, when I was 14 or 15, I went to the local museum and saw a lot of displays of remains found on Mound Street in Alameda. And it wasn't long after that that some of my friends who lived in that area started telling me stories about weird things that went on in their, their homes. Yeah, like, and that's why. when I realized that their homes are built on top of Indian burial grounds, and that's probably why. Wow. And it's yeah, like most people, like most people, they just take a friend. Oh, that's the name of the street, and that's what it is. Whatever, or uh, 
with yeah. a mountain. Oh, whatever. People don't. Not very. Not many people do exactly what you did, Jeff. Which is to mm-hmm. find out. There's got to be something here going on. As to well, they had over here in uh, Florida. Uh, you know, we have this big lake in the middle of the state called Lake Okeechobee, and especially mm-hmm. at the turn of the century. Um, a lot of it was there was a lot of bass fishing and you know the commercial fishing. I mean, people go out there for sport, but a lot of and catfish, and the um, the fishermen out there when they threw out their nets, they said that they would bring in skulls. It looked like a pumpkin patch. Oh and, wow! And originally, they were thinking um, they were trying to date it. You know, as far as when the settlers and I believe that uh, the last time they tested one of them, it, it looks possibly like. I mean, it predates even the actual Native Americans that are here in this area. It looks like an older tribe, and uh, they're guessing that they looked at the lake as a like a portal. In other words, you disposed of your dead in the mm-hmm. lake is what they're guessing, because even that tribe, you know, they they either leave or they just become other tribes. So there's nobody alive, in other words, and there's no written record. But yeah, they sometimes it's unusual. So that yeah, we have a lot of um, different reports along the lake shore of hauntings, and I'm sure some of it is tied into that uh, of oh yeah um, of the Native American, you know, because this is where they they apparently thousands. Uh, this was where they would put their their dead. Uh, mm-hmm. And and I and I tell people, well, it's the same thing. Also, you know, you hear about all these. Um, out in Europe, you know, those bog people and stuff, uh, places like yeah. that were often looked at as the in between, like the doorway between this world and the next. So, oh, yeah. And, you know, the spirits don't have a clock. So, you know, you think of, well, how could there be a ghost there if the guy died, you know, 600 years ago? Well, it's easy because that's they don't have a time function in the spirit world. You know, they could right. have died six or seven hundred years years ago, and then now they're in your bedroom. Right, and then we're thinking because your house and I can't even your house I, is built. And let me ask him because Jeff, I was let me tell you something. I'm totally surprised by what you said because basically what you're talking about is what the bubonic plague is. What you were saying that hit San Francisco. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's it. I, what do you think that was because it was a port city and it was brought in by a ship, or what yeah. do you think? Yeah. yeah, in fact, they traced it back to the ship that oh, really? brought it in, and they think the rats came off the ship and started infesting people on the waterfront, and it spread very quickly. Yeah, yeah, because of uh, that rat of all things. My God, you find that yeah. all over the place. Yeah, a lot of people in, who live in the Bay Area are clearly unaware that there was a plague here at one time. I had never heard of that. I mean, you know, you yeah. always, you know, you always hear of, you know, back then that yeah, well, there was TB and they had the Spanish influenza and all that stuff, but I had never heard of that. Yeah, well, that is quite, so quite interesting. Something. Killed quite a few people. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, especially that's the thing that some of these diseases and these illnesses they. They kill you very quickly, in other words. There's a very short incubation period, and then you're dead quick. <laughs> you know, if there's... Yeah, and there was, you know, there's no IV um, fluids given and no antibiotics, no antivirals, uh, no nothing to, to support the person nutritionally, so a lot of them just died, yeah. Let me ask them, Jeff, because I know a lot of people ask me this a lot. They think that of why are do, well? Let me ask you. Put it this way: Do you think c- cemeteries are haunted or not? Cemeteries are not nearly as haunted as people like to think. You okay. know, people think that oh, you go there, it's loaded with ghosts. The ghosts that are that are there are usually ghosts of people who actually worked at the cemetery, like grave diggers mm-hmm. or or undertakers. But also, the few ghosts that are there are those in whom the, the grave's been destroyed by uh, environmental processes like a hurricane or something like that, or vandalism, or they may be in the wrong grave and the headstone is, is wrong, or something okay. along that line. But usually, if there's a ghost there, that's the reason why. Okay. However, there's a lot of paranormal activity in graveyards and what these are are residuals 
And a lot of it is imprints, emotional imprints left on the environment by family members who visited the grave right. for sometimes many decades and poured out their emotions. Sure. And when we're alive, we all create these imprints. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine a graveyard filled with granite, wow. which is uh, going to pick up these imprints and record them and keep them for decades, uh, so when you go into a graveyard, you're going to pick up light anomalies, you're going to pick up cold yes. cells, sounds, EVP, even uh, other things like that that make people think they're, ex they're experiencing a ghost, but in fact, they're picking up a residual. And you know why? The reason why I asked you is because, and I, you know, I, I go along and I know what you mean. You know, you're thinking, okay, if this person's buried, you know, in a cemetery, yeah, you might have. But uh, the other day, who was it that was discussing that they were talking about um, a family. They, as a matter of fact, they wrote a book about it. The, the lady wrote a book about it. Who they're originally from Texas, and their dad died. I want to say it's Chicago. I think I believe it was Chicago, and um, mm -hmm. they decided years after their dad died that they wanted to bring him home. In other words, rebury him down in, I guess, the family plot down in Texas, mm -hmm. and they went up to Chicago and. It, apparently it's one of these you know Chicago being an old city was one of these I don't know which exactly which cemetery it is but it was one of the bigger older cemeteries which there's a million graves and number one they got they had a really hard time locating them uh, they were told that because they, that they couldn't even roll in there uh, one of those uh, you know uh, like a digger to go in there they had to do it by hand to make a long finally come to find out when they start digging up where their data finally they told them after they ran around and they had to basically do the research themselves where it was that he was you know they had found basically his plot but where he was uh buried they find out they're digging that that's not where he was they found somebody else in other words okay yeah and it became old, like old wrong grave <laughs> wrong graves that but it, that especially in some of these older cemeteries that's that's more common yeah. than most people think uh oh it is because sometimes floods hurricanes tornadoes rip through a cemetery and and after it's gone people go in there and try to replace the headstones and they get them in the wrong spot right and they just set it's... them up wherever they think they're supposed to go and hope for the best right and then, uh, and you know and sometimes it makes me wonder you know I, and i understand where, you know if that something like that happens where hey you know Sometimes everybody thinks of like nobody has to put it bluntly time for the dead. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> these are strangers that are basically taking care of you. But, um, you know, you have a lot of uh, it almost sounded like when they started investigating. That's why I'm saying she even wrote the book about it uh, that apparently was really common. It wasn't just, oh, we had the bad luck that our it was our father's grave. That wasn't really where it was supposed to be. And things like that. And it makes me wonder sometimes if that's also some when you, and. And sometimes, you know, you want to, you think about it, you say, well, once you're dead and you, let's say you leave and you really don't need your body, for all you know, you might not even care what happens to your body because you're like, you're enlightened and you realize I don't need a body anymore. But then I'm thinking, mm -hmm. well, what if you're one of these people, especially maybe not so much modern times where your religious beliefs, even if you want, and by this, I don't mean you had to be hardcore religious, but people, you know. Don't realize yeah. uh, a while back. The, the burials that long time ago people it really mattered to them to be buried in consecrated ground. That this was you know this was what you wanted for your remains. People really cared about that. Nowadays you know cremation's more accepted and but back then people cared about like you know are you going to bury me in hallowed ground? Uh, am I going to get lost? You know some uh, clergyman to officiate over my burial? Uh, all those things. Where if you're still around mm -hmm. at some point, oh, yeah. and this doesn't happen, you like I'm not leaving. Hey, what happened to my? This was important to people. A lot. Of, I don't think a lot of people. Yeah, there's a that. lot of there's a lot of enculturation that goes into people's thoughts about dying and and care of your remains afterwards. And so, as you said years ago, um, people really cared about that quite a bit. And that's why you go to these cemeteries and you see really ornate tombstones and. Um, right and and other monuments and these days not so much you know people are content to be dumped in the ocean and that's it yeah. or just placed on a hillside you know that's it so that's a difference 
Right. It's not just as important as it used to be as far as, um, I mean, you even heard mm-hmm. of some people when they were almost, I want to say, when they were young, they were already, you know, if you had some type of money, you know, you were preparing the family vault or a big memorial and this is where the whole family was going to get buried and even when people yeah. were young, it wasn't that they were old and sickly. They were preparing for this sometimes long before they ever died. Oh, yeah, yeah. Your your niche was in reserve for you amongst all the family ancestors. And, um, Jeff, I wanted to ask you, I saw mm-hmm. that you did, which, I, which is great, that basically you have your books are based like a ghost hunter's guide to different mm-hmm. cities. And yeah, that's the Ghost Hunter series. It's published by Pelican Publishing of New Orleans, and it's currently nine books. Mm-hmm. And they they focus on a specific geographic region, like like Seattle, Portland, New Orleans, Southern California, San Francisco Bay Area, Wine Country, and Gold Rush Country, so forth. Okay. And then I have some textbooks also. I have three textbooks available on Amazon.com. Okay. about paranormal investigation. One of them focuses on crime scene investigation, which really? is really fascinating. Wow, I yeah. think that is so That's interesting. My, oh, yeah, paranormal CSI is really, really cool stuff. Uh, it can be a little hazardous for a lot of reasons, uh, but, yeah, it's really cool to go to a place very, very soon after a mm-hmm. murder or something like that. It's amazing what sensitive people can pick up. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, one time I did an interview with a girl. She used to be... She was living in North Dakota, but at one point down, up in northern Florida, she was a coroner, you know, the ones that go in there and just give a, basically, reason for death. And, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of times they're called into pretty ugly uh, scenarios, you know, sometimes people have been dead. I asked her, I said, hey, did you ever go someplace where you got a weird feeling versus others, I guess? I mean, besides what you were looking at. Yeah. She says that a couple of times, yeah, she did go to certain places where it's almost like she felt like this person is there watching, yeah, especially where they, the bodies have been undiscovered for like a few days and then finally they become aware and, of course, they go in there. It didn't even necessarily have to be a violent or, a, you know, murder or anything. It was just that some people sometimes, especially if they, they're not in touch with that many people, days could go by before anybody discovers that they've passed away. And she said, yeah, I mm-hmm. kind of felt sometimes like that person was there watching. And, but she says, I didn't really try to think about that because if not, you know, you're not there for that. You're, you're there just to do your job and you've got police and other people sure. around you uh, just to make mm-hmm. sure there's no foul play involved. But um, yeah, I think that, that, cr- that criminal, um, and like you said, uh, even sometimes as time goes by, especially if something violent happened at that location. I imagine that it has to leave some type of imprint. Depending oh, on yeah. What There's a lot of imprints, and some psychic detectives use those to figure out clues to the perpetrator because sometimes they'll actually get a vision of the person's appearance, or sometimes they'll pick up odd things about their behavior, either a tone of voice, an accent, or even a sound of them walking on pavement in a way that suggests they have a limp Mm -hmm. or an an abnormal gait. And psychic detectives have used these things as means to identify the perpetrator. Yeah, so going to crime scenes is really interesting stuff. It's a little hazardous. You have to be careful. Right, depends on where you go. Because you never know if the guy who did the crime is still hanging around to see who's snooping around looking for clues. And then people in the neighborhood are usually very sensitive after a crime, of course, and they object to somebody who's gone in there looking like they're in for the thrill of just poking around. So you have to be a little cautious and respectful and and not not too ostentatious about what you're doing. Right. But crime scene (laughs) crime scene investigation is really an interesting way to approach the paranormal. I think so. I think so. I mean. People don't realize that uh, things like that when they happen. Uh, I mean, there's it's like it's basically so, sometimes it's very apparent what happened, but sometimes there's layers under upon layers as far as how this ended up happening. In other words, how this crime ended up occurring. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh yeah, and sometimes we can pick up clues as to whether the the victim knew the assailant. 
that's something that the police always try to establish and sometimes with great difficulty, but a psychic may pick that up very quickly if they can pick up EVP of casual conversation, even an amicable conversation that kind of went bad, something like that. So um, a lot of a lot of police departments, FBI, DEA, others use psychics. They don't admit to it. Yes. But they do use them. Um, yeah, yeah, they do. And and a lot of, yeah, I mean, there's, I understand it, believe me, I, because uh, I, locally, and I'm not going to get into it, you know, I know that they, they're very, very private, and so, sometimes they won't even contact you directly. They'll have a person, a uh, person go, th- in other words, have a third party contact a sensitive or a psychic yeah. just to get their impression yeah yeah because if key evidence turns up you can't take that into court of law and say well the psychic told us where the, exactly. the weapon was buried exactly. because right away most juries will just dismiss that so yeah, no, that the defense so attorney is going to jump all over you know, and tell it a lot of district attorneys won't want to admit to it but that's really what's going on oh yeah Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Let me ask something, Jeff. As time has gone by, because you told me that that story about that sailor, that, that must have been like such an eye opener when you were twelve years old. Especially it the really no was. eye it, part. That's like it freaked oh. me out because I'd seen a lot of sailors around town, and because it's a navy town, uh-huh. and this guy didn't look like any of the people I have been seeing. He looked like his clothes were really old, dirty, tattered clothing. And he had a big bag slung over his shoulder, which they call a sea bag. Uh-huh. And in the old days, a sailor could have only one bag up aboard a ship, and all your worldly possessions were in that. And and like I said, he had no eyes, and that's what really freaked did, me did out. Did he look solid? I mean, it sounds like he, he looked oh, pretty yeah. solid un, until the, uh, he just looked at you and was like, oh, <laughs> He looked completely lifelike until he started fading away as he continued walking across down the street in front of our property. Jeff, let me ask something. As time has gone by, have you gotten more sensitive? Uh, have you been able to fine tune it? Uh, or do you do, you know, I remember like uh, that part in the sixth sense at the very end with a little boy, you know, the lady's gotten just gotten hit by the bicycle on her bicycle. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden he's seeing her there. Do you ever find yourself yeah. in those scenarios where all of a sudden you're just doing your thing and, yeah. and you see something or somebody? I do that uh, actually fairly often. I'll I'll see things. I work in a hospital and oh. I see that oh a lot God. in the hospital. I'll see people who I know it, who died and uh, they show up. Um, yeah, I do run into that. I'm just kind of open to it all the time, I guess. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's it's experience it at the most inopportune time sometimes, but yeah, that's what happens to me. Jeff, do they key in that you're able to see them or is it just? Yeah, I actually had a conversation with one fellow named Charlie not long ago. One of a fellow who I know died and I was walking out the front of our hospital and I saw him walking towards the hospital and I was astounded, but I said, Charlie, what are you doing here? And he said, his wife's going to have surgery. And I said, that's why you're here. He said, yeah, yeah. And he just you know, walked past me and walked towards the main entrance of the hospital. And as I watched him, he just faded away. So he was coming back to be with his wife while she had surgery. Wow. See. Yeah, and he looked completely lifelike and when I spoke to him. And then he just started fading away. That is incredible. Yeah, it's almost yeah. Like, like there's there's so much... Ar- um, around us that's unseen and you know I tell people you know you sometimes people think that the ghost or the undead or whatever you want to call them I don't want to use undead that sounds like a zombie but ghosts or discarnates are only present like if you go to a so-called haunted house or haunted location and I tell them there's a lot most of them are not bound to a certain house yeah, they're all around us they all can the time. be they can be anywhere yeah literally literally anywhere I think mm-hmm. that sometimes we don't see them as much because we'd be we pulling our hair out. I don't think we could carry on our normal mm-hmm. lives if we were seeing people that have passed away all the time. Like sure, do other people, but they're... well, most people go through the day with a low degree of receptivity. In fact, a lot of empaths try to to shut down their receptivity so they can get through a day without interacting with twenty different spirits. And so, most of us do just 
unconsciously shut down our receptivity so we can wander around places and really not see anything. But if you open I think a lot of people also, that's why also you have what they call those crisis apparitions, the ones that, especially when it's like a family member or death, you know, uh, when somebody's just passed away, that they all see that family member. Mm-hmm. I think those are the people that yeah. that uh, they do shut it down, but it's just this one time, it's like it's too overwhelming, or that person that's passed away really wants to just say like a goodbye, that mm-hmm. they have no choice but to yeah. say that. The goodbye experience is fairly common. People experience that, you know, often during the funeral or, you know, the, when all relatives gather at the house afterwards. Yes. Um, it's, I've heard from so many people that they've gone off to go to the bathroom or something, mm-hmm. and while they had a moment alone and they got kind of quiet, they would hear the voice of the deceased or even see the person, you know, so that's always weird and and when I've been to very few funerals in the last several years but I always look around for the deceased <laughs> standing in the crowd <laughs> yeah I believe definitely. it I believe it mm-hmm. I believe it what is it you know that thing about you know I'm going to pretend I'm, yeah I, I wish I could attend my own funeral and I think to myself people if only people knew that more than likely, the, most, the person's there. Most people probably do attend their own funeral. Yeah, yeah, they see who's there, who didn't show up, who's really sorry about it, or who's gossiping. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of weird conversations that go on at funerals. Definitely. So, Jeff, thank you so much for spending this time. It has been fantastic. Um, like I said, you know, I enjoy talking to somebody who's been doing paranormal research mm-hmm. long before it became. I want to say mainstream, um, because I, it's it's come a long way. It's it's a lot of uh, it's just different as far as what's happened. I want to say in the in the last few years. Like I say, everybody. I remember mm-hmm. when I was a kid. I the most you had was uh, books from Hans Halter. <laughs> That's oh, yeah. what was out there. <laughs> yeah, I've got one of his books. I think yeah. somewhere. Uh, yeah. Well, it'd be great. Thanks for, very much for all this time. And if you direct your readers or listeners yes. to my website, it'd be great. Absolutely. There's a link. I've been showing uh, slides of uh, some of your books that you have out there. And of course, absolutely, there's mm-hmm. going to be a link to your website. Uh, so if mm-hmm. anybody wants to get a hold of you, or uh, also if they want to purchase any of your books, absolutely. But thank you sure. so much. I truly appreciate it. Take care. Oh, wonderful. And we'll talk again sometime. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Okay. Great. All right. Good night. Good night. So, guys, what did you think? Come on. I think it was great. But you know I am. You know how I am about these things. I always think it's great. (laughs) Again, you know, guys, I interview a lot of people. You know I do. I interview a lot of people. And I interview a lot of authors slash paranormal investigators. And I always say the same thing when I talk to somebody who's been doing this as long as he has, because I understand it because I came from that. I've been doing actual investigations since the 90s. And before that, of course, you know, I was involved in it. Um, It's just people don't realize, especially if you're a little bit younger, that back then, especially if you really were into it besides reading a book people looked at you like huh and I was like what um, and I really enjoy talking to somebody who's gone through that transition of the last 20 or 25 years okay where the most you got was like he said that show sightings or around Halloween time of course that everybody did some type of docu-series whatever little thing you know the, the ghosts uh, in the castles in England or uh, some of the things here, like a lot of them were like the, in the Northeast, like New York, uh, which were traditionally haunted locations, but not like it is now. Not like it is now. Uh, and you know what? He made a very good point about how the good part of it, and I've said this before, that paranormal investigations or research has become so mainstream, which is fantastic. Because now you don't get those looks like you're into what? Uh, But the flip side is that some people want to play by hard and fast rules when it comes to documenting paranormal occurrences. 
and you can't do that. And I've said it. I'm the first one. I believe in science. I believe if you've got something that you can use to capture it, whether it's a digital record, whatever. And that's very, by the way, that was really interesting what he said at the beginning about the EMF. Okay, a lot of people, because they see it on the show, they go off and they purchase the piece of equipment, sometimes pay a lot of money for it, and don't really do the research as to what are the false positive readings you can get from this piece of equipment. What are the things around it that are going to give you some type of feedback? And it's anything but a ghost. So um, that was really interesting. But I think it has to be a combination. You know, photography, video, uh, anything. But but there's other things. There's 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 the psychic or the sensitive. I, I ask a lot of the groups I interview, do you have a sensitive on your group? You know, some some of them double as sensitives. Uh, you know, dousing rods. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can, because if sometimes I've been on countless investigations where the equipment and the sensitive all go off either at the same time or one before, right after, even if they're in different parts of a house or a location where they don't see each other. Okay. I've been doing investigations where I'm saying something's going on and all of a sudden things go off like and that there's no way to explain that except you know we the humans we are equipment too our feelings uh you know what we capture how we feel especially if you have somebody that's a little bit of, has some experience in the field okay and they know how to interpret their own bodies Okay, that uh, when that that you know when I feel this certain thing, this is what this means, or whatever. Everybody's you know we're all individuals and we all process uh, information or feelings or however it's coming into you different ways. But when you get somebody that understands themselves pretty much and what it means, a person like that can be invaluable. And then you get your equipment or whatever to kind of like. Uh, validated because like in everything you you want more than one source especially if you've got two so i think that's fine and, and that thing that he said about the bubonic plague in san francisco i had never heard of that what a, an eye opener can you imagine living out in a place where you never know if like he said you want to put a, a a swimming pool in your backyard it's like cross your fingers and hope you don't dig up a few coffins <laughs> it's gonna be so disturbing <laughs> interesting but disturbing of course you know when you're a paranormal researcher that's like yay but yeah i've heard of that i have heard of that like we were talking about that that case of that little girl's coffin and they said that that's quite common and that even people in the neighborhood know it and then that you'll get whole neighborhoods who have some range of stuff going on and it's kind of understood because many people if they don't exactly know they suspect that that whole neighborhood is sitting on uh, what used to be a cemetery, it's not that they don't know that it used to be a cemetery, is that they all kind of know that there's a lot of coffins that were left behind and not moved to the new location. So yes, that's that's that poltergeist reference. Nobody believed that back in the 80s. That was that's that's very very common, more so than people think. So anyway, guys, please uh, hit the like button, subscribe to my channel. Uh, I'm asking my true believers again to send me in your videos, your MP3 files, uh, anything that you, however you want to communicate with me and tell me your ghost story, your encounter with the unknown, your, you saw Bigfoot run across the road in front of you, uh, whatever, you had a premonition of a dream and it came, I'm here. I want to hear it. I want to hear it. I want to hear it. If you want to email it to me, do it at MarlenaMimigosChronicles.com. But again, I prefer that you video yourself with your phone like i said if not if you want to record yourself and send me an mp3 file and uh i'll uh i'll i'll somehow include in one of my shows um i would love to hear it because it's incredible for all the shows that we see with all these scary locations and people's first-hand accounts to me the things i've heard it's incredible the experiences that are like really hair raising <laughs> that people have had so i would love to share that like i said if you want to say look 
Marlene, use only my first name. That's fine with me. Or don't use my name or make up a name. That's fine with me too. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, so please don't forget about that. Also remember, uh, uh, podcasts of this show, they're uh, available usually within 72 hours after the show is released on iTunes, on Spreaker, on iHeartRadio, on SoundCloud. You can also go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com and you can download, you can either listen to it or download the MP3 file of the podcast if you'd like to do that. So again, guys, thank you so very, very much for coming back, watching all the shows, and of course, listening to everything. Thank you so very much. I really appreciate it.